program at San Quentin provides college preparatory courses and uh, liberal arts courses leading to an associate of arts degree to over 300 men at the prison. The only requirement for, for participation is that students have to have a high school diploma or a GED. Um, but about 90%, I would say, of our students are not ready to do college level work when we get them. One of the central challenges that has shaped the evolution of the program over the last decade has been this question of how best to prepare students to do college level work when they come to you as underprepared academically as these students are. When we first delved into just the idea of creating a robust college prep program, I initially assumed that we were seeking primarily pedagogical best practices, strong instructional materials, and outstanding teachers. But over time, I came to realize another component of college readiness, which was at least as important or as critical to our success, and that was trust. There are a lot of paths to prison, but most of them are characterized at least to some degree by academic failure. Sometimes it's the peer group, the culture of the peer group. It isn't cool to be smart or to care about school. Or students believe that making some money quickly will improve their life prospects more than school ever could. Others simply buckle under the overwhelming stress and instability of home. Absent or addicted parents, physical violence, homelessness, hunger, exploitation, and abuse. Parents are high on meth or crack. Siblings are hungry. There are no clean diapers in the house. No one reads anybody a bedtime story or checks the kids' homework. But imagine you're a kid in this type of situation with some kind of learning difference. Unless the teacher writes what they're saying on the board or draws a picture of it, you can't seem to understand what they're saying. Or you know you did the math problem right, 8 times 7 equals 56. You put the answer down. It's right there. But the teacher is saying you've written 65. But when you look at it, you still see 56. Or say, even when you try really hard, you just cannot sit still in class. You're constantly fidgeting, and the teacher is always angry at you for distracting the other kids. Or else, you just can't concentrate on anything. You have never heard the words visual learner, dyslexia, ADHD, or PTSD, for that matter, and nor has anyone you know. I can't tell you how many people there are in prison with backgrounds like this. One extremely smart student of ours who was physically and sexually abused by his mother's boyfriends and later by his stepfather was told by his family while he was growing up that he would never be able to learn because he was retarded. But what might any of this teach us about learning and the, and, and the role of trust in learning? I first began to think about this issue when I so often heard new students expressing amazement. Amazement that when students struggle, teachers are patient, they don't get irritable or angry or insult or humiliate their students. Amazement that teachers in the program work as volunteers and don't abandon their students when myriad institutional obstacles make things incredibly tough. Amazement, too, that the program is supported by donations from strangers. Who are all these people, students ask, and why are they helping us? These questions are often asked in a somewhat jokey way, full of wonder and gratitude, but the reality is that for some people, simply being treated with kindness can be a disorienting and even overwhelming experience. At first, I thought this was because of how antithetical the culture of the, the college program was to the experience of incarceration. The contrast between the classroom at St. Quentin and the, and the world outside the classroom is incredibly stark. But for a lot of people, being in prison is just a very intense, very toxic version of life. During a class discussion, a teacher has offered an opposing opinion to a student to get, to get that student to develop, further develop an idea. Or in another case, the teacher has written some gently worded but critical feedback on a paper. The student comes to me seeking my opinion, not so much about the word's meaning or the legitimacy of the criticism, but about the teacher's underlying intent. As we read the comments together, I realize the student is struggling not to read everything the teacher has written in the voice of an insult. He reminds me of someone who is prone to hallucinations, asking someone they trust if they hear the same sounds that they do. It is an effort to establish what is actually real. This student is seeking the help of someone he trusts to clarify his teacher's intentions because he is trying to trust his teacher. What does it mean to be paranoid when you've lived most of your life in the charge of people who really did hold you in contempt or who were, at best, utterly indifferent to your subjective experience or your needs? A student may want desperately to learn. 
and may even know full well how academically capable he is, but a part of him may also be shouting danger. This person is going to try to hurt you. You should get out of here. And that here may be school. The more I grasp what these some students are up against internally, the more stunned I am by their perseverance. If a student at St. Quentin stops coming to class, we, as Lisa said, we sometimes go over to the cell blocks of the dorms to find him and ask what's going on. One of the first times I ever did this, I found the student up on the tier by his cell. He was a little surprised to see me there. When he finally understood why I was there, he was so moved that his teacher had noticed that he had disappeared that he almost burst into tears. Another student has lost the almost finished draft of an essay assignment because of a cell search in which a great deal of his personal property had been destroyed. He had assumed that his teacher would accuse him of making excuses, and so he had decided not to return to class. A student who disappears is not necessarily one who lacks motivation. And by the same token, a student who feels that his teachers and his school care about him as a person is much more likely to communicate, accept help, and persist. A huge part of the problem here is that in some students' minds, asking for help means exposing vulnerability. And the first thing many people learn, both in prison and in life, is to conceal a vulnerability at all costs. For some people, and this is particularly extreme in the example of people who are illiterate in prison, or sort of like trying to help somebody with a disease that they're afraid to let you know they have, for some people, exposing vulnerability equals death and is also terribly humiliating. In certain respects, prison culture is just a microcosm of many people's minds when under psychological pressure, especially many men's and boys' minds. And some people do not even have a concept of asking for help. They have either not internalized it as a possible course of action, or else they have banished it from their conscious minds so that it simply doesn't occur to them anymore. Sometimes both need and hope have been replaced by a mental fog or a pervasive sense of dread and hopelessness. Getting help must be taught patiently, both as a concept and as a skill. We have also learned that the public image of the college program within the prison community is critical to the success of our work. The more our students understand that we are centrally motivated by a concern for them, the more comfortable they become engaging with us both personally and professionally and academically. I stopped someone on the yard I, who I know is a friend of a student who, stopped, who has stopped coming to school and I asked him what has become, his, become of his friend. When I did this in the beginning, people were reluctant to give up any information at all for fear of getting the friend in any kind of trouble. It was as if I was asking them to snitch, which is obviously in this environment no small thing. If I was lucky, they would agree to relay the inquiry to the friend. Over and over, I explained that I didn't want the student to stop participating in school and wanted to know if there was anything I could do to help. If I had a penny for every skeptical look I've gotten at St. Quentin, we would all have endowments now. <laughs> Today, students generally welcome this kind of questioning because they know where we're coming from. Now, it's often students themselves who call our attention to other students who are floundering and who conspire with us about how to re-motivate those men and help them get caught up. And they're also constantly bringing, recruiting new students to come to school. Probably the most powerful force in the world for breaking people out of this kind of isolation of being afraid to show vulnerability or ask for help are other people who once lived and thought this way but no longer do. The more academically advanced and psychologically self-aware students in the college program have a spectacular capacity to reach the most fearful of men. They share their own stories. They offer support and encouragement. They model healthy dependency both on us, program staff and teachers, and on each other. They are living proof that trusting others is not only possible, but life-sustaining. All these students bear living testimony to the extraordinary resiliency of the human mind and the human heart. They form, for me, an endless chain of human beings who keep going back for those who've been left behind and who remind each of us of why we must never stop doing this critically important work. Thank you.